Hi everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Book It. We kick things off today in the kitchen, a place where I can sometimes feel pretty mediocre. Author Leanne Brown is here to help. Her cookbook, Good Enough, is full of recipes to feed your body and your spirit. Leanne, thanks so much for having us over today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I'm very excited to cook with you. I am too. I feel something's gonna happen yeah, for you. Yeah, I do you. too. I'm yeah. excited well, actually. I, I hope it does because <laughs> my children will thank you. Your newest cookbook is called Good Enough. Yeah. So tell us what that means. Tell us a little bit about the cookbook because it's not really traditional. No, not at all. It's very much, so it's interspersed, it's recipes interspersed with a bunch of these personal essays. And it's sort of about this space of cooking, cooking but really feeding ourselves as this place where we take care of ourselves and we also take care of others. And that that can become this space where we can feel really tight and like we're not doing a good enough job. Mm -hmm. Or a good enough job or that it can become much deeper where we actually believe that we're not good enough somehow because of the way that that part of our lives is working. Or maybe it's actually about other parts of our lives. But so much of our experience about how we feel about ourselves, I think, is acted out in the way that we approach feeding ourselves because it's such a fundamental part of how we take care and how we nourish ourselves. Most of the time what we really need to hear is that we're already good enough. We are already actually there. What we need is to know that wherever we are is okay. You are very candid in the book about your own experiences yeah. and what you've been through. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I love about well, it though. Thank you. Yeah, well I think you have to be honest. Um, you have, because it's, I've always believed that Essentially, the more honest you can be, the more open you can be, the more unembarrassed by your true experience, the greater gift you're kind of giving to others. And I think that's such a good feeling. So it's about trying your best and appreciating your best and that your best will change on different days. Yeah. And being flexible enough also to accept whatever it is that occurs and even laugh about it. Your first cookbook was Good and Cheap. Yes. Tell us about the premise. So it is a cookbook for basically built around a SNAP or food stamps budget, which at the time was about $4 a day. Now it's about $5 a day because of life, um, which is still very, very little. And that book started essentially as your master's thesis yeah. and went viral yep. and took you by surprise. Very much so. Yeah. The level of interest was quite astonishing. I was so touched by it. And it's been um, downloaded now, what, millions of times, right? Millions of times, I believe like 15 million times. And it's yeah. free. It's free, yes. You say in the book that after your first cookbook, your first book, Good and Cheap, you found yourself burned out, depressed, struggling, um, yeah. and in a way that is what led to this book. Can 100%. You, can you yeah. tell us about that time period? Sure, yeah, right after it had been so exciting, but it had also been very overwhelming and I was pushing myself enormously. And I also felt like I didn't know how to sort of be myself in this new space of being very expansive, of talking to these large audiences. I would often, I would feel wonderful actually at the events, but then when it was over, I would just feel sort of empty and like mm -hmm. unsure and was I doing the right thing and all this kind of stuff. And then the other thing that happened was sort of once things slowed down, I also got pregnant really quickly. And unfortunately I, had like morning sickness for the entire nine months of pregnancy. So I was nauseous and ill throughout the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Tough, I know. Really, really tough. And especially if you're a food professional, I was just like repulsed yeah. by food. <laughs> and so, oh trying to, so trying yeah. to sort of do the work and think about it was so challenging. And that made me feel like, who was I? And the truth is we grow and we change as yeah. our life circumstances change. And that's so important and I think Actually, thank you for bringing that up because I think that is so important for the way that we approach food is that what we'll enjoy and what will work for our families and for our lives is going to change over time. One of the other things you said in the book that uh, I really related to was that you said sometimes you felt like a fraud about your own oh eating habits, gosh. like nuts over the sink, maybe some cold pizza for breakfast. All the time. We're all actually struggling with the same sorts of experiences. And I think that that speaks to so much. We all feel a little alone in these daily struggles and we feel like other people are doing it better. I was making myself feel bad for eating nuts over the sink, but if I reframe that and go, how great is it that I like had some nuts over the sink even though I was so busy and tired? I fed my body 
wonderful. Right. Good job, me. You know, like, why can't we truly, like, yes. that is nothing to be ashamed of. That's a wonderful thing. And cold pizza for breakfast is delicious. I mean, what a resource to have in your fridge. And I didn't even need to <laughs> warm it up. What a joy. You know, like, it truly, <laughs> these things can be wonderful. It feels to me like kind of what you're really getting at in the book is cooking with compassion for yourself. Exactly. That's I right. also, I loved in the book, T-L-D-R. Yes. Loved it. Can you explain? Yes, I want this to catch on. It's so TLDR in the tech world means too long, didn't read. And everyone says about, uh, about recipes, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, I know you're supposed to read it all the way through, but like I didn't. And, and no. then you are halfway <laughs> through and it's like, and rest overnight in the fridge. And you're like, no, like you're going to have these <laughs> exactly. moments, exactly. right? Yes. Which are terrible. And yes. I don't want that to happen to anyone. Yes. And so I just thought this would be a great thing for recipe as well is just to have a really simplified version of the recipe up top. You have that mental picture of what you're doing and then so if you want to read it all the way through you can and if you don't you know that you still have the basic sense of it. And do you believe that cooking is a way that we can find some measure of inner peace? 100%. It's just there. And Yes, it is always there if we can just be with it because when we can be in the kitchen and we can be engaged with just the simplicity of exactly what we're doing, we calm our body, we calm our nervous system. It's something that is actually very simple to do and you do it just by being there. So Leanne, what are we making today? We are making a chorizo, white beans, and green stew. And so we have chorizo sausage today, but we could use any type of sausage right. that you like. And then white beans, again, I just think it really goes well, but you could use any type of bean, black beans, like the complete opposite, it would be wonderful. And I'm using shallot and you could use onion, white onion, yellow onion, red onion, anything, add garlic, add all kinds of other vegetables. I think cauliflower would be particularly amazing in this. Okay, cauliflower. Um, but basically it's veggies and sausage and a little bit of tomato paste as well. Okay. That really sort of amps it up. And then we add in greens at the end and we have, uh, I have some like salad spinach. So that's what we're gonna do. But we could use something heartier. Truly this is like a master stew sort of recipe and you can make it your own. Okay, great, so where do we start? We are gonna start with chopping our vegetables and so I'm going to just chop these two shallots in half. When I am doing something, especially something as simple as this recipe, where yes. I'm literally gonna just be chopping two kinds of vegetables here. Okay. It's not gonna take me that long. So I try to just not rush myself too much because we're always in a hurry in our daily lives. What I'm noticing right now is that this is actually quite pleasurable and this is quite satisfying to do. It is hard though to stay in a moment, right? It I is. mean, it's hard in anything. It's hard for me to do in a yoga class. It's hard for me to do in a lot of moments in my life. So yeah. it's a challenge to focus just on cutting the onion. It is such a challenge, but every time we do it, we're building the muscle to do it. So in terms of this recipe, Leanne, it seems like this would be a pretty affordable recipe. Yes, would you say? absolutely. Yeah. And I think the most expensive part is really just the meat. You know, we've got canned beans and sort of basic vegetables and you know tomato paste of which you use just a very small amount so this one's very affordable and if you wanted to make it vegan and skip the meat it would be even cheaper so this is really it i'm gonna get you to okay, open good. these cans for me all Can right you to use one of these little guys uh, oh my gosh this is really going to be mortifying that my portion of the demonstration has come up and i don't know how to open the can it's kind of weird just for me Okay, there we go, we've got it open, Woo. Awesome, so that's like all the prep work and now the rest will just be quickly done in the pot. Okay, yeah. we move on to the pot. Move on to the pot. So this will just allow, just for like five minutes or so, let it come to a boil and then I'll turn it down to simmer. And then, so we might walk away for a few minutes just to allow this to do its thing. And then we'll add the greens and serve it up. Okay, that's great. It. I'm, I'm excited about this step of this land. You're literally just gonna throw We're just gonna this Put some in. greens in. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's so good. 
We made it together. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> From mindful practice in the kitchen to another type of self-reflection that leans on ancient philosophy. It's something of an age-old question. Can virtue be taught? Can we really take our game up when it comes to being good people? City University professor Massimo Pilucci has some answers in his book, The Quest for Character. Massimo, thank you so much for coming by today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So your book is called The Quest for Character, and one of the essential questions that it asks is whether or not character or virtue can be taught. And you take readers back to ancient philosophy to explore that. So can you explain? Yeah, the first person that we know to ask that question seriously was Socrates. And he was a little skeptical initially about whether virtue can be taught, whether one can improve uh, one's character. But it turns out that he makes eventually an analogy with playing an instrument. So let's say that you want to play the alto sax and you know nothing about music. What are you mm -hmm. going to do? Uh, the first thing you're going to do probably is to learn a little bit of theory about music, right? You want the notations and you know, how the, the notes refer to each other. You want a saxophone that you can play and you want a teacher that can uh, point out to you what you're doing that it's not quite right and how you can improve. But mostly you practice, 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 practice. And it's the same with virtue, which essentially means a attitude, behavioral attitude. So a virtue is something like generosity or courage or temperance. So not to kind of give away the ending, but do you believe then that virtue can be taught? Yes, I believe it can, or at least I believe that people can improve. Just like with music, some people will probably have a naturally more generous character or more courageous or more temperate, and some people will have it less. One of the stories you explore in the book is the relationship between Socrates and Alcibiades. How does that play into this discussion? Yeah, Alcibiades was a fascinating figure. He was a friend of Socrates, one of his students, rumored to be one of his lovers. He was an incredible person. In fact, I'm surprised that nobody's made a movie out of the life of Alcibiades. This guy was impossibly handsome, uber rich dashing, brave. It was like anything you can possibly want in a human being. And of course, therefore, he had a very high opinion of himself. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to lead Athens. He wanted to be a leader, a, a statesman, a, a general, which eventually he did, in fact, become. But when he was very young, in his early 20s, he goes to Socrates for advice and says, you know, do you think that this is a good idea? Do you think that I should do this? And Socrates basically puts him down for an interview, for a job interview. <laughs> and it turns out a few minutes into the job interview that things are not going very well because Alcibiades is a narcissist. He's into self-aggrandizing. It's clear that he wants to do things for himself, not really for the good of others. And so at some point, Socrates says, you know, my dear Alcibiades, I love you to death, but you really shouldn't get into this thing because otherwise you're going to make a mess. Turns out, he was right. <laughs> History sort of proved that correct. <laughs> Absolutely. Alcibiades does go into politics. Uh, he's brilliant. He has a lot of success initially. But then, of course, his character emerges. His flawed character emerges. He starts making one mess after another. And eventually, 20 years later, he gets killed by Persian spies. There, there was a point in the book, um, you give a very interesting example. And it's attributed to a second century Stoic philosopher who said, most of us dread the deadening of the body and will do anything to avoid it. About the deadening of the soul, however, we don't care one iota. Yeah, that was Epictetus, who was really an interesting character. He had a sense of humor bordering on sarcasm, as in fact yeah. this particular quotation clearly shows. He was a very famous teacher in the early second century. He was actually a slave. He started out his life, his life as a slave. He was mm. freed later on. He started learning and then teaching philosophy. But what Epictetus is saying there is important. That is, we spend a lot of time taking care of things that are not really that important, such as our appearance, for instance. And yet, for the really important things, our character, we don't give it a second thought. Another thing in the book that I found really intriguing was your discussion around how well we know ourselves. Because we hang out with ourselves all day. So we figure, you know, we know everything there is to know. But in fact, you say that's pretty superficial. It is pretty superficial. You know, if you still today, if you go to Delphi in, uh, in Greece and you go where the Oracle of Apollo was, 
uh, you would see at the entrance of the temple a, uh, an inscription that says, know thyself. The Greeks thought that knowing yourself is a fundamental thing because if you don't know yourself deeply, not just superficially, then you're going to make all sorts of mistakes. So what is the first thing we should be doing to really know ourselves? Two things. One is engage in critical self-reflection. The uh, Greco-Romans did this thing which sometimes is referred to as philosophical journaling. So before going to bed in the evening, you take a few minutes and you start writing down things that happened to you during the day where you struggled for some reason. You didn't react in mm. the best possible way. And then you ask yourself three questions. What did I do wrong? What did I do right? And what could I do better the next time that something like this happens? The idea is not to indulge in regret and beat yourself up or anything like that. It's to learn from your mistakes. That is really interesting. That's the first one. The second one is to engage in dialogue with others. The famous Socratic dialogue was really aimed at learning about yourself. So you talk to somebody else and that person ideally helps you to figure out who you really are by questioning some of your assumptions, by asking you, well, is it really what you think and why do you think that? Because I think so often what we tend to do in conversations, particularly with people we know, is affirm each other. Correct. Not challenge each other. That's right. Aristotle said that a good friend is like a mirror to your soul. Is somebody who actually has the courage to look you in the eye once in a while when it needs to be done and say, you know what, that was not good. Yeah. Why don't we talk about it? I got a couple friends like that. <laughs> good. Good for you. <laughs> Two is all you need. It's not, you don't need many. Yeah, not everyone, right? <laughs> no. Okay. You talk about this gap between how good we are and how good we think we are, and that virtue or good behavior can sometimes be situational. That's right. In fact, the term character gap uh, comes from uh, the work of a psychologist, uh, Christian Miller, who actually studied these, these things empirically. And yes, there is usually a gap. You know, we're, we're never as good as we think we are or we <laughs> would like to be. But the point is that modern research does show that once we're conscious of that gap, mm -hmm. then we can work on it. You're right, a lot of our reactions are situational. For instance, one of my favorite examples is if you, there's research that shows that if people walk into a mall where there is uh, bread that has been baked recently or a pastry that has been baked, they are more prone to behave nicely toward other people. So the smell of baked goods uh, <laughs> prompt you to behave nicely. Now, one way to, to use that might be to just bake breads everywhere. Right, and, you know, all the hope time. That all the time. But just get very carb-heavy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But another one is to make people aware of this. And once you make people aware of the fact that their reactions actually uh, appear to be influenced by things that have nothing to do with ethics or with ethical decisions, then they become conscious of it and they say, oh, wait a minute, but I am actually, I want to behave that way regardless of whether there is the baked bread in the, in the background or not. So once you become aware, you actually try... Uh, most people try to behave better, and they succeed, uh, sometimes remarkably so. How did you come to philosophy? A midlife crisis. <laughs> Which I, I think is kind of funny. It, it, yes, Not your I, typical it, midlife crisis. No, it isn't. No fast car. No fast cars, no, no nothing like that. Uh, what happened was that uh, my first career in academia was going very well. I was a biologist. But then I started asking myself what I wanted to do the same kind of things for another 20 or 30 years. And the answer was no. Uh, so I decided to do something else. I looked around and the thing that I found that was exciting was philosophy and I switched. And so then you go about getting your PhD in philosophy. Correct, because I didn't want to just be a scientist who plays at being a philosopher. Uh -huh. I really wanted to be a philosopher. All right. And, and does being a professor at City College, does it inform your writing in any particular way? Does working with students change the way you approach some of these issues? Yes, absolutely. I often use my students uh, to try out some certain ideas. So mm -hmm. if I have an idea of how to present a particular topic, then I'll do it with my students and see how they react. Mm -hmm. It's really, I tell my students that being a university professor is like being a stand-up comedian, although not quite as funny. <laughs> uh, you know, you try out new material on the audience and then you take notes on how right. the audience responds and then yeah. you say, no, nah, that didn't work. Yeah, so that I, one fell you know, flat, so no, right? Out. Yeah. Or you want to modify and you change it. Maybe I'm going to try it again in some other way. I have to ask, if you had to sort of explain in a sentence how you feel this book and ancient philosophy, could help our elected officials today, what would you say? So my suggestion by the end of the book 
is that we should do two things in order to improve the body politics. First of all, get rid of as many current politicians as possible. <laughs> and that is up to us because so long as we live in a more or less democratic country, you know, the buck stops with us. We are the ones that elect these yeah. people. We are the ones that keep making the same mistakes and putting a lot of narcissists and self-interesting people out there. So it's up to us to change it. But most importantly, we need to change the next generation. It's our kids that we need to take care of. And we don't do a good job of teaching character and virtue to our kids. In fact, we pretty much ignore it. Mm -hmm. And that's it to the pedal of future generations. Well, that is really interesting. Thank you so much for all this time. You have given me a lot to think about. That was the idea. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Now to our regular segment, Uncensored. Award-winning columnist and author Linda Stacy is back with her reviews. And as always, she's got plenty to say about what she's reading. Prince Harry's new ridiculous memoir, Spare, should have been titled Spare Us. Personally, I find the royals as useless as legs on fish and even more annoying than shrink wrap on cardboard. But Harry and Meghan, man, they're a whole other hellish level of useless and annoying. And him, I find he's like the Fredo of the royals. They keep begging the public to give them privacy. Then they do not one, but two Netflix docuseries about themselves. Now self-promoting Harry has written a giant whiny tome about his entire life. You know, people are dying and suffering all over the world, and he wants everyone to feel sorry for him because his big brother wasn't nice to him. Big brothers are never nice. It's encoded in their DNA. But of all the cringy, bad stories Harry tells in this tell-all, make that tell everything he can think of, he tells the one about his frostbitten todger. Yes, a todger is exactly what you think it is. And by the way, this guy has more nicknames for his moving man parts than the Brits have for him. Anyway, he says his todger got frostbitten in the Arctic, but when he got home, he decided not to, quote, overshare that information with his daddy. Really? Then why in hell is he sharing it with us? He recalls that it hurt so much that he rubbed his frozen popsicle with his late mother's favorite lip balm before his brother's wedding. My God, talk about a Freudian slip showing. Since Spare's release, Harry's popularity has tragically dropped by 45%, according to one poll. But his wallet? That's grown to epic proportions. Spare sold nearly a million and a half copies the first day. It should only happen to me. Hopefully, he doesn't keep his newly fat wallet next to the lip balm. On a completely different note, however, is The Secret History by Pulitzer Prize winner Donna Tartt. Even though the book was published in 1992, it's like a blue chip stock. It's always good. This is the story of a group of oddball college students at a progressive New England college who study under only one professor, a charismatic classical Greek scholar. The novel, erudite yet readable, is the story of this tiny class of hard-drinking smarties who exist in their own bubble. They quote ancient Greek philosophers the way other kids quote football stats. It's all golden until these smarty pants scholars go off the rails and murder two people, including one of their own. So here's the question, are they smart enough to get away with murder? The secret history is so good, it almost made me forget about Harry's frozen todger. I said almost. I'm Linda Stacy, and I'm still uncensored. That is our show for today. Thanks so much for watching. A quick reminder to check us out on social media. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you disagree with Linda. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Book It.